Thank you for joining us today. And in today's study, we're going to be wrestling with a very hotly debated question. And that question is, who is Mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation? Who is Mystery Babylon in the book of Re Revelation? And in our study today, uh, I've divided our study into uh, three critical parts. And one of the things that I wrestle with in scholarship is deciding uh, how much is enough and uh, how little is too little. Uh, I am doing my best to give to you what I believe are the absolutes in all of our studies. Uh, our studies are not five minutes long because we're, uh, we're not trying to create shallow roots for you in the Word of God. We want you to have a depth in your knowledge of the Bible, but today I'm going to restrain my comments to three critical parts. First, I want to talk to you a little bit about the key historic information concerning the data of Babylon and Mystery Babylon. Second, I want to, uh, and I want to be cautious in this, uh, I'm going to be sharing with you some, some views on Mystery Babylon, uh, some of which I strongly disagree with. But I also am wise enough to know that those of you that are students of the Bible, and especially the hundreds of thousands of our students around the world who like to study Bible prophecy and end time prophecy and eschatology with me, I'm also smart enough to know that you probably read and listen uh, to other views. And if you listen to other teachers, sooner or later, you're probably going to come across some of these views on Mystery Babylon that I don't believe really pass the test of proper biblical scholarship, but I believe it's important for us to take a look at them so that you'll understand their particular position. And then thirdly, I want to conclude with what I believe to be one of the most important things you need to understand concerning Mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation, and that is it has a dualism. Uh, there is a, a, a dichotomy or a dualism in understanding this final Mystery Babylon that arises and has a prominent involvement during the tribulation period prior to the second coming of Christ. And so those will be the three parts of our study today. And we're going to begin in the book of Revelation and the 17th chapter. And so if you have your Bibles, go with me into Revelation chapter 17. And we're going to begin reading at verse 1. And I'm going to read down through uh, verse 6. And I'm reading today out of the New Living Translation. Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 6, our subject today, Who is Mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation? The scriptures read, One of the seven angels who had poured out the seven bowls came over and spoke to me. Pause right there. The seven bowls, uh, we come out of Revelation 16 into Revelation 17, finalizing the bold judgments. And so that's what John is writing about here. He said, come with me and I will show you the judgment that is going to come on the great prostitute who rules over many waters. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk by the wine of her immorality. So the angel took me in the spirit into the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that had seven heads and ten horns and blasphemies a, a, against God were written all over it. Verse 4, the woman wore purple and scarlet clothing and beautiful jewelry made of gold and precious gems and pearls. In her hand she held a gold goblet 
full of obscenities and the impurities of her immorality. A mysterious name was written on her forehead. Babylon the Great, mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. As we always do, let's begin our time of study uh, with prayer. Father, once again, as we open up the Holy Bible, we humble our hearts before you and before uh, the multiplied thousands of people who currently and in the days ahead will be listening to this study. I pray for them, and I pray most of all that you would open their understanding to receive and to understand the truth of God and that the truth of God in these last days of human history in which we live would secure them. My prayer is that not one person within the sound of my voice will be absent in eternity's morning. May they have a surety that their heart is right with God, and I pray that you would use our time together to draw them closer to you. May each and every one of them know that there's no sin in their life, in their past, greater than your grace. And we thank you that the Bible still declares in the 21st century, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Guide us in these moments by the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of the Holy Spirit. And for all of these things, we'll be careful to give you praise, for we ask it in Jesus' name and all God's People said, Amen. As we take a look today, particularly at Revelation chapter 17 and 18, as I have taught you uh, through our studies through the years, if you're a faithful student, uh, you understand the importance of studying the Bible within context. We always have to be incredibly cautious when we narrow down a phrase like we're doing today, Mystery Babylon, and that phrase is found in a single verse. We have to remember that to understand any mystery, we have to understand within full context. And so we need not only understand chapter 17 and the verses that deal with Babylon, we need to take a look at chapter 16, at chapter 18, both before and after. And we need to keep those within the understanding of the full narrative of the book of Revelation. Because when we violate proper hermeneutics and the proper interpretation and reading and understanding of Scripture, that's where poor teaching always has a foothold. And so we are going to focus upon Mystery Babylon in Revelation chapter 17. But we need to understand that in the context of what we're dealing with, we're coming out of Revelation chapter 16 and the conclusion of the bold judgments and their final and climatic ending. And many novice students of the book of Revelation uh, rush quickly forward to uh, the Battle of Armageddon and the apocalyptic ending of the Battle of Armageddon that occurs by the second coming of Christ. As you remember, the next major prophetic event in Bible prophecy is an event called the, the Rapture of the Church, which will be followed by a seven-year span of time called the Tribulation, that is divided into two parts. We have the first half of the tribulation, which is distinctly different in outcomes in the first three and a half years. And then we have the second half of the tribulation. Many scholars refer to the second half of the tribulation as the great tribulation. But the tribulation is seven years in duration to the exact day by the Hebraic calendar of 360 days. Seven times 360 equals the exact number of days that the Bible prophesies for the length of the tribulation. The tribulation begins with a very defined moment. We read about that in Daniel chapter 9, and there the Bible tells us that the Antichrist 
will be identified because he'll be the charismatic world political leader who's going to sign the peace treaty of seven years with the nation of Israel. The day that that man, that political, charismatic, global leader signs the peace treaty with Israel is the exact day that the tribulation begins. The tribulation ends with the second coming of Christ. We read about that in Revelation chapter 19. And so we don't know when the rapture will take place, but we do know from Bible prophecy the exact timing of the tribulation and many of the events that are contained therein. But sadly, many novice students of Revelation, they want to rush from the bold judgments in Revelation chapter 16 and they want to rush into the reading and the teaching of the tribulation period, the second coming of Christ, followed by the millennium, the eternal kingdom of God, etc. And I have seen many times, both in preaching and teaching and in authorship, that Revelation 17 and Revelation chapter 18 are passed by. But we need to understand that Revelation 17 and 18 that deal in particular with the rise and the dramatic fall of Mystery Babylon were not put there uh, by accident. This is a very important prophetic piece in God's divine calendar. And though some give lesser attention to Mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation, Babylon is a significant part of the book of Revelation and final Bible prophecy. And in our study today, you'll understand better why. In the book of Revelation, one out of every 10 verses is connected to Babylon and the subject of Babylon. Babylon is mentioned 260 times in the Bible. There's only one city in the Bible mentioned more times than Babylon, and that is Jerusalem. And as we go into our study today, part of it we're going to be dealing with the duality of mystery Babylon, and you will see that there is an incredible difference between the city of Babylon and the city of Jerusalem, and this is important in understanding prophecy passages throughout the scripture and an important foundational truth in your study of eschatology. So Babylon is mentioned 260 times in the Bible. Only Jerusalem is mentioned more times, over 300. But let's get right into our three sections of study. And if you're taking notes, number one, let's do the data of mystery Babylon. Let's do a bit of study and a little bit of background to help you to understand mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation. You need to understand a little bit about the first Babylon. Uh, we need to have a primary understanding, uh, and I, I've always taught this. I believe it more now than ever before. You can't properly understand mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation the second Babylon, if you don't understand the first Babylon. And the history of Babylon begins with the Tower of Babel. Uh, those of you that are longtime students of the Bible would probably know that, but many, if not most, do not. The building of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, is where the first city of Babylon originated because after the flood, Noah's descendants arrived at a land called Shinar, which was located on the Euphrates River. And this became the building site of the Tower of Babel. The city of ancient Babylon would have been located in what we now understand as modern day Iraq. There's also uh, evidence that the original Garden of Eden would have been located not far from there. But in Iraq, 
Babylon would be located approximately 50 miles south of modern-day Baghdad, uh, again located on the Euphrates River. And by the way, uh, if you have not listened to our study on the drying up of the Euphrates River in Bible prophecy, when you have an opportunity, make note of that. Uh, there's more data there that will help you in greater depth with this study. And uh, that is a very important thing to understand in Bible prophecy because we are actually watching with our eyes currently the drying up of the Euphrates River, which the Bible said in final Bible prophecy is be going, going to become a highway for a coalition of forces that will join to come against Israel to assault and attack and overthrow Israel and will be defeated by the very hand of God. But Babylon comes from the Hebrew Babel, which uh, some scholars point out is a Hebrew form of the Assyri Assyrian word Babali, which meant gate of God, gate of God. But in Hebrew, Babel means confusion. And that's exactly what happened there is they built this tower and God uh, became a part of destroying uh, this rebellious attempt and gave multiple languages, which was a part of his original plan that they had tried to circumvent. But Babel in the Hebrew means confusion. It is the root of the city of Babylon, which was a real city located in modern-day Iraq, about 50 miles south of Baghdad on the Euphrates River. Now, I don't have time to uh, teach on it, but there is evidence that this location uh, is not forgotten. As a matter of fact, uh, not long ago, uh, Saddam Hussein uh, put billions of dollars into trying to reestablish the splendor of, of Babylon and uh, he was doing his best to revitalize that when he began that effort and was pouring that amount of wealth into reestablishing Babylon as a world city. Prophecy teachers at that time just went crazy thinking, wow, we're seeing uh, the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And of course, as you know, uh, he was captured and then finally faced judgment for his atrocities and was executed. But there is still a lot of work going on in that region of the world. Many of you may not know this, but the largest embassy that America has, we built in Babylon and it is located on a larger piece of ground. It's actually a, a small town, as it were. I believe it encompasses over 180 acres, and uh, it is a small town, as it were. By far, uh, the most wealth that America has ever poured into an embassy was built in the area of Babylon. But as we get back into the Bible in Genesis chapter 11 verses 3 and 4, we read about this blatant rebellion of the people of Shinar under the direction of Nimrod against the plan of God. God had ordered man to multiply and to fill the earth. The original plan of God would have established nations uh, geographical boundaries, national identities, races, and with time, uh, diversities in languages. That was the plan of God. But man in sin and in carnality always fights against the will of God. Many of you have done that in your life knowingly or unknowingly. You've rebelled against the covenants and precepts of God. This goes all the way back to the very early civilizations, and in particular, we're focusing upon this civilization and the Tower of Babel. Their rebellious plan attempted to build one single humanistic community that would be centralized by a glorious single city. 
And the very centerpiece of this act of humanistic rebellion would be this tower that they were going to build to reach to heaven. Now, literally, they did not have the technology nor the ability to reach into heaven. But if you've listened to our studies, the Bible speaks about three heavens. And they were attempting to build a tower into the first heaven, which is the atmosphere that surrounds the earth. And that first heaven, that's what the Bible mentions when it talks about Satan and demonic hordes being the prince and the power of the air. They have dominion in that first atmosphere that surrounds this earth. The very purpose of this magnificent tower would be to make a name for man in defiance, open rebellion against God and God's plan against nationalism. Now, we also know that there is no doubt that the elites of that society, there are always those who make uh, mass populace subservient to those who are in power. And no doubt the elites, in fact, there's various writings from non-biblical books that give us evidence for this. Part of their plan was to build this tower into the heavens because you'll remember they are a civilization post-flood. And so the Tower of Babel would have actually have been for the elites in their mind, a place of security that if there was a massive earth flood, even though God had promised that he would never destroy and judge the earth by flood again, that the elites could have gone up into the high places of this tower and part of the tower would have been the capacity to be high enough to provide a safe place as it were in a future flood. So as the first Babylon was rooted in direct rebellion against the divine plan of God, don't miss it, mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation will exhibit the same defiance. And so there we've taken a foundational look at the historic data of mystery Babylon. If you do not understand Babylon 1.0, you will be hindered in understanding the prophetic Babylon 2.0 in the book of Revelation. With that said, let's move to point number two and let's talk a little bit about the dualism of mystery Babylon. Because as you study the Bible and as you'll learn in the moments ahead, there is a very distinct dualism in this mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation. The wicked earthly city of Babylon stands in stark contrast to the holy heavenly city of Jerusalem. So one of the dichotomies that we see in Bible prophecy, as I mentioned, Babylon is mentioned 290 times in the Bible. The only city mentioned more frequently than that over 300 times is Jerusalem. So as you're studying the Bible in full context, you have two cities that jump out of the book with this great focus of attention that God purposefully and obviously intended to be a part of sacred scripture. You have this Babylon and then you have Jerusalem. One is a wicked earthly city, Babylon, and the other is a holy heavenly city, Jerusalem. And so in stark contrast, we see, and that's just one level of the dualism of mystery Babylon. Babylon is described in the Bible as a vile prostitute in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. And again, the dualism, Jerusalem is described as a virtuous bride in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Revelation describes mystery Babylon uh, as a dualistic entity in and of itself. So we not only have this stark comparison between Jerusalem and Babylon, 
But even Babylon has a dualism in its biblical uh, definition. And if you're taking notes, this is important. Let me give them to you. Number one, we read and study and, and reveal Babylon as a religious city. It has strong religious global impact. But the dualism of that in Babylon, it is also powerfully involved in world commerce. And so we have a religious Babylon and we have a commercial Babylon. Now, when we study the tribulation, and I'm trying to be careful not to go uh, too deep into the weeds here because I want to stay on the highlights of our study, but when we study the seven years of tribulation in the Bible, the Bible is divided. Uh, we read about this division in, in Daniel. Daniel divides the tribulation period into two, three and a half year periods. So the dualism of Babylon, mystery Babylon, defined in the book of Revelation, in the first half of the tribulation, its primary role is a global, influential, religious city. Babylon will be a part of endorsing this one world religion that is coming upon the earth. But in the last half of the tribulation, its role shifts. And again, another level of the duality of mystery Babylon is in the first half of the tribulation, its primary role is to set the stage for a one world religion and to be uh, as it were, a promoter of the Antichrist and his religious system. But in the second half of the tribulation, Babylon's part shifts more towards its impact and in it, its influence, both commercially and politically. In Revelation chapter 18, Babylon is seen as the center of economic power connected with the merchants of the earth, and those who are also involved in maritime activities. Of course, Babylon is going to uh, be one of the great pieces in end time prophecy that will, as it were, almost be the Wall Street of final Bible prophecy. Biblically, it is viewed as the devil city. And many believe that indeed, just as God has a capital city, God's capital city is obviously Jerusalem. The Bible tells us that after the second coming of Christ and into the 1,000 year millennial period, that Christ is going to reestablish his throne in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem will move from not only being the capital of Israel, but will become the capital of the entire world. So just as Jerusalem is God's capital city in Bible prophecy, Babylon from Genesis to Revelation has been described as the devil's capital city. And lastly, and I end with this third piece, which is of utmost importance, and that is the debate of mystery Babylon. We've talked about the data of Mystery Babylon, and I've taken you back to its origins and its history and given you a basic understanding of Babylon 1.0 and its defiance, rebellion against God, which is exactly the same spirit that will be a part of Mystery Babylon 2.0 in the book of Revelation that will emerge in its full prowess during the tribulation. Again, the first half of the tribulation, Babylon Mystery Babylon will be extremely influential in this one world religion, but in the second half of the tribulation, it moves towards a commercial and a political impact and influence because the Bible tells us there'll not only be a one world religion, there'll be a one world money. Revelation 13, no one will be able to buy or sell without the mark. There will be a one world economy enforced by a one world military and a one world religion 
a one world leader and a one world government. And I have much teaching on that. If you're a new student at uh, your leisure, be sure to go back and study that. But let's wrap up our study today by dealing with the debate of Mystery Babylon. Uh, throughout the years, there's been great debate concerning the identity as to who is Mystery Babylon in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Now, those of you that have been students of the Bible, those of you that are students of eschatology and end time events, you probably, if you've done any amount of reading or have some books in your library on the subject, you probably have heard one scholar or maybe several scholars try to identify Mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation as the Roman Catholic Church and in particular the Vatican in Rome. Now those of you that are Catholic, uh, please don't get mad at me. I love you and uh, my wife was born and raised Catholic and this is, please trust me, this is not an attack against you if you're Catholic. I just want to show you why some people believe this. Now I'll state right up front, I do not believe that Mystery Babylon is defining the Roman Catholic Church or in particular the Vatican. But I need to, if you're going to trust me as a teacher on eschatology and final Bible prophecy and allow me to be a trusted voice for communicating the Bible to you and answering difficult questions as we do on our channels, then I have to be able to talk to you as an adult and you have to be able to listen to me as an adult. So for a moment, lay aside all preconceived ideas and all temptations to flare up and to be emotional about this, I'm just warning you that if you're going to study in depth the mystery Babylon of the book of Revelation, you're going to find a long list of even some very notable scholars and names who will try to lay out a case that mystery Babylon is the Roman Catholic Church and in particular the Vatican. Now the strength of this view uh, does have a biblical source that they run with. And that is the book of Revelation talks about this city uh, and its seven hills. Now, if you're a student of history, certainly you know that historically Rome has been one of the world's preeminent cities influencing commerce and religion. And again, as I've already taught you about the significance of the dualism of understanding Mystery Babylon, it has a dualism in many regards. Rome and the Vatican and the Roman Catholic Church, uh, for many it's easy to kind of push them into that biblical criteria because perhaps the capstone to this view is that Rome is and still is has been referred to as the city of seven hills. And the Bible mentions the city of seven hills in conjunction with Mystery Babylon. And so again, this is really kind of the capstone from which this view originates. Uh, let's take a moment. Go to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17 because in my years of preaching and teaching, I've asked, uh, had many people ask me, where in, in the Bible is that found? So let's look at one of the descriptors of Mystery Babylon in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 9. The Bible says, This calls for a mind with understanding. The seven heads <clears throat> of the beast represent the seven hills where the woman rules. And so because Rome is called and has been called historically <clears throat> the city of seven hills, those who build upon this view, this is where they'll take you into the Bible to lay the foundation for their debate. But again, I do not agree uh, with this view and I'll explain why in the moments ahead. Now you're also going to discover in this debate that there are those who try to build a case that the United States of America 
is the mystery Babylon at the end of time because of our historic impact on world economy, commerce, and our evolving religious apostasy. And so if you're going to look at America through that lens of biblical criteria in Mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation, you can probably push the United States of America into that definition. It's hard to ignore America's blatant moral descent in recent years, its religious apostasy, its political corruption, and its global cooperation. And so those who try to define in this debate of Mystery Babylon that it's the United States of America, I understand the lens that they're looking through, but again, I respectfully disagree. I do not believe that the Roman Catholic Church, I do not believe that the Vatican, I do not believe that the United States of America is the mystery Babylon found in the book of Revelation. Now, is it possible, if not probable, that all of the above that I've mentioned will play a significant role? Probably more towards probable than possible. Others make a case that it's New York City, and especially because of the impact globally of Wall Street. And uh, there are, again, recognizable and notable scholars that build a case that Mystery Babylon in Revelation 17 is New York City, along with Wall Street, because of the biblical criteria uh, in Revelation chapter 17, uh, verses 1 and 2, where the Bible says, the prostitute who rules over many waters, and obviously New York City is located on the East Coast in the Atlantic Ocean. Many waters refers to uh, global uh, involvement. But it says, the prostitute who rules over many waters, the kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk by the wine of her immorality. So another view in this debate of Mystery Babylon is New York City slash Wall Street. Now there's a group of people in the world of theology, they're called preterists. P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-T-S. -E -E preterists. Now it's a theological term. It refers to a group of people, preterists. Let me give you a simple definition. Preterists are Christians who believe that all of Revelation, all of its prophecies, have already been fulfilled. And they primarily believe that the events in Revelation were fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus and the Roman Empire in A.D. 70. Uh, Preterists will lay out a case that uh, Nero was the Antichrist uh, I'll deal with that perhaps in a future presentation more in depth as to why I believe that the preterist view is, is not an argument uh, that I can stand upon. I, if you're a preterist and a, and a follower of Christ, I love you, but I would strongly disagree with the preterist view because, first of all, and primarily, uh, the preterists believe that everything in the book of Revelation was fulfilled in A.D. 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem. They believe Jerusalem was mystery Babylon. She was the vile prostitute, etc. Uh, which again, uh, Jerusalem has had some dark chapters, but she has been set aside as God's capital forever. That's the word of God. God himself said. Over 3,000 years ago, Jerusalem will be my capital forever. But primarily, uh, I believe what has really been a difficult thing for preterists to deal with is now we have the exact date of the writing of the book of Revelation. And if you have any modern Bible at all, and you go to Revelation chapter 1, and you look at the notes before the book begins, and you'll see some background and historic data and divisions, etc. You'll see date. Uh, 
uh, timing of the writing, date of writing, and you'll see A.D. 95. Uh, there might be a version or two that says A.D. 96, but pretty much the writing, the date of the book of Revelation is established at A.D. 95. So that would by itself completely eliminate the view of the preterists because they believe everything happened in Revelation uh, in A.D. 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem. But let me give you the biblical reasons why I believe that Babylon will be the resurrection of the old Babylon. And again, I'm not going to part company with other Christians who disagree with me. This is a secondary matter. It's not a primary doctrine. And I'm not absolute on it. I, I'm not going to die on this hill but I believe that when you study the totality of the Bible, when you study the totality of what we understand in the Bible, mentioned 290 times, when you study the dualism of Babylon and you bring all of these uh, bits and pieces together in a prophetic puzzle, I believe the weight of biblical scholarship, listen carefully, tells us that Mystery Babylon in Revelation will be a revival and a reconstruction, which is currently going on, it has been going on, of the original city of Babylon. I believe in the tribulation and probably before the tribulation begins, because we already, as I've mentioned, I don't have time in this one study to document all of the revival of the city and the billions of dollars that are being poured into bringing this fantasy city back into a place of global distinction. But do your homework on that and you'll find that it's true. But I build this upon biblical reasons. First of all, in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 18, Babylon is described as a literal city. In Revelation 17 verses 15 and 18, Babylon is a city of worldwide impact and it appears to be the capital city of the Antichrist. Now again, as previously mentioned throughout the Bible, Jerusalem is seen as the capital of God. Babylon is seen as the capital of Satan and the throne uh, of the Antichrist, so to speak. So I do believe that it is referring to the literal city of Babylon. In Revelation 17, verses 4 through 5, as well as found in Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, Babylon is described as the world center of a false religion. In Revelation chapter 18, verses 9 through 19, the Bible describes Babylon as that city of global economic and commercial authority. Revelation 17 verse 6, Revelation chapter 18 verses 20 and also verse 24, Babylon persecutes the Lord's people. In Revelation chapter 18 verses 8 through 10, also in verses 21 through 24, and I know that I'm covering a lot of passages quickly here, but with the modern technologies that we have today, whether you're listening to uh, this teaching on our YouTube channel or our podcast channel or other formats, you probably will have the ability to hit pause. So if you're wanting to write these references down and go back and listen to them, uh, feel free to do that. Revelation 18, verses 8 through 10, also in the 18th chapter, verses 21 through 24, Babylon will be destroyed suddenly and completely at the end of the tribulation, never to rise again. And if you're taking notes, write those words down. Babylon will be destroyed, never to rise again. So it's clear in the book of Revelation that Babylon is both a city as well as a system. And uh, I mention that to you because some that debate 
uh, that Babylon, mystery Babylon, Revelation 17 is not an actual city. It refers to a system. That would be uh, some of the people who would uh, deal with the argument of the Vatican or the religious systems of the Roman Catholic Church or New York City and Wall Street, etc. They put a whole lot of weight upon mystery Babylon is not a city, it's, it's a system. Well, that's because no one has ever taught them or perhaps they don't agree with the dualism that we see concerning mystery Babylon in the Bible. But once you've been taught, and I've only scratched the surface, but once you've been taught that there is a dualism clearly seen throughout the Bible in its references of Babylon, then you're able to see that it's both. It's both a city and a system. But taking all the accounts into view, the best view, and this is my opinion, the best view that has the heaviest weight of proper biblical scholarship is that the city of Babylon, Mystery Babylon, is the actual city of Babylon located on the Euphrates River in modern Iraq that will be brought back to its full splendor either prior to the tribulation or as I've already mentioned to you, we already see the evolution of that uh, billions of dollars are being funneled back into its splendor. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine why America puts so much money into our embassy. Our embassy uh, in that part of the world dwarfs our embassies anywhere else, actually a small town. So in conclusion, as we wrap up this study, I want to bring your attention to the full book of Revelation, because Mystery Babylon is a part of the book of Revelation. As I've mentioned to you, uh, Babylon is mentioned or connected in one out of every 10 verses throughout the book of Revelation. But the author of the book of Revelation, John, wrote the words of this book, Revelation, over 1900 years ago. But we who are now living in the 21st century, can clearly see how incredibly accurate his prophecies were. Because Revelation's end time prophecy of the world establishing a world political unity is visible in the United Nations. John in the book of Revelation prophesied the world would establish a global economic unity. We clearly see that established in the World Economic Forum. John in the book of Revelation prophesied that the world would establish a global religious unity. We clearly see that in the World Council of Churches. Everything that John wrote in the book of Revelation, most of it we are seeing literally. And my belief is that Mystery Babylon will be a literal city. It'll be the revival brought back to its splendor and infested by demonic impact and hordes. It'll be the actual city of Babylon in Iran located on the Euphrates River. These present day global entities that I've just mentioned to you, whether knowingly or unknowingly, I, I don't know which, I, I have a feeling. Uh, I lean one direction as you might imagine, but these global entities that I've mentioned to you, they have set the stage. And even though the rapture has not yet taken place, it, it causes me to wonder how much closer must we be to the rapture in light of these things. But these global entities that I've just described, fulfilled, though they were prophesied by John the Revelator over 1900 years ago, in the 21st century their fulfillment is blatantly obvious. The stage is being set for the eminent announcement of this global one world leader whom the Bible calls the Antichrist. Their one world agenda is currently restrained by one thing, and that is the work of the church age that we are currently living in. Paul, 
in the New Testament, <clears throat> in writing two letters to the church at Thessalonica, he said, until the restrainer is removed, they do not have the power to continue in the end time capacity that they will have after the rapture of the church. However, after the rapture, the end of the church age, which culminates, and as I've stated, I don't know how many times, the next major prophetic event, I believe, is the rapture of the church. The restraint of the righteousness of the church in the world is then removed. And when it is removed, the Bible said these apocalyptic events will accelerate with an incredible capacity of being fulfilled because the restraining power will have been removed. One scholar, I wrote it down word for word, and I close with this. He said, during the tribulation, people will desperately seek religion because of what will be happening in the world. As the hammer blows of God's judgment devastate the earth and terrorize its inhabitants, people will turn in desperation to the Antichrist as their savior. Aided by the false prophet and hordes of deceiving demons, the Antichrist will establish a worldwide religion. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. Who is the mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation? As I have made clear to you, there are many views that have been debated throughout the years and will continue to be debated. But I believe the weight of scholarship for reasons already stated rests upon it is a literal city and it is the exact city in the exact location that it was so many years ago. They're on the river banks of the Euphrates. We are seeing its splendor being sought after once again. In light of all of this, my goal is not to frighten you or to terrorize you or to make you feel uneasy. If your heart is right with God, these things should really enhance your faith. It should strengthen your ability to believe the accuracy of the Bible because Bible prophecy is what separates the Bible from all other world religions and all other sacred writings and books. Only the Bible has prophetic content. Approximately 28 plus percent of the Bible is prophetic in content. Every single prophecy has come to pass exactly as was stated in the scripture. Those that remain will come to pass as accurately as well. The most important decision you need to make is you need to live every day ready to meet the Lord. With every Bible study, I emphasize this over and over and over. This is not just an intellectual ascent to Bible knowledge. It should strengthen us to live ready to meet the Lord. Are you living ready to meet the Lord? And if not, would you pray with me right now? Many people call it a sinner's prayer. I, in childlike faith, believe the verse in the Bible that says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Jesus, his very first message was repent. His very last message was repent. In Luke's gospel, we're told, unless we repent, we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Will you make peace with God with me right now? And if you pray this prayer with me when you're done, it's very important. Will you please go, it's on the website, to lostlamb.org and click on New Beginnings and follow the easy prompts. I've prepared a number of items and teachings for you there that will help you not only in starting your faith but building your faith and continuing in your faith under the coming of the Lord. But right now, let's make peace with God. Pray by faith with me, just wherever you're at. Just say, Heavenly Father, Today, as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. I want to be ready in these last days. I recognize my sin. I now repent of my sin. And I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. 
With the blood he shed on the cross, wash me and cleanse me. Come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. I vow this day I'll live for you. In place of my weakness, fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me your power to be what I ought to be. Today, I surrender my life to you. And I am no longer the property of sin. I am today a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come in to stay, come in to my heart, Lord Jesus.